Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Power Hungry Podcast. I'm Robert Bryce. On this podcast, we talk about energy, power, innovation, and politics. And I'm pleased to welcome back for a record-tying, fifth time, my friend Roger Pilkey Jr. Roger, welcome back to the Power Hungry Podcast. Robert, it's great to be here. Now, I've uh, had you on the podcast before. You are the author of The Honest Broker uh, on Substack. Uh, but as you know, uh, podcast guests here introduce themselves. So imagine you've arrived at a, somewhere you don't know anyone. You have 60 seconds. Please tell us who you are. Well, if, I, if I'm if i sitting on an airplane and I want to not talk to somebody, I tell them I study climate change. And if I want to have a good, long, in-depth conversation, I tell them I study sports governance. Um, I, I do research and writing and do a, a bit of practice in areas where science, technology, politics, and policy all collide. Um, usually controversial, difficult, sticky topics, um, which are fascinating to study and I think really important for society. Good. Well, I, I want to talk about climate and I want to talk about sports, but, but I also want to discuss your latest essay, which you wrote. And by the way, you're the author of eight books, the latest of which is what? I'm sorry. What was the latest one? The latest book is The Edge, which is about cheating and corruption in sports. Um, I had a second edition of my Disasters and Climate Change book come out uh, right after that one. Um, but that one wasn't new. That was more of an update. Gotcha. And uh, before I go on, you can find Roger, Roger Pilkey, Jr. Substack.com. Um, okay, so you had a piece that I, I, I wanted to have you on again, because I thought this was a really interesting and, and I think an important piece. You co-wrote a piece with Matt Burgess. It was published on the, uh, the Heterodox Academy site, and the title was Partisan Science is Bad for Science and Society. And I want to read this part because you, you mentioned you talk about the sticky interface, right, between science and policy. And we're seeing this more and more, and it, particularly how you wrote about the recent IPCC report and how the public-facing documents and what was released to the press and how the press reported it didn't match a lot of what was in the report itself. And further, that the IPCC report had a lot of, well, this word misinformation has been overused, but bad, bad reporting, bad attribution, bad, poly, bad, bad in, in reporting, I guess would be the way to say it. But let me go back to the heterodox piece. You said this push, those pushing for science institutions to become more explicitly partisan usually make some version of the following two arguments. Scientists have a trusted and respected position in the society. We should uh, capitalize on that authority to advance our shared progressive political views and preferred policies. And second, that scientists are not perfectly objective and science has always been influenced by politics. Therefore, we should be intentional about politicizing science in ways that advance important public positions and policies. But then you said, and this is the key thing, I think that uh, you and, and, and Burgess wrote, to put it bluntly, if scientific institutions continue to openly and preferentially support the progressive wing of the Democratic Party's preferred positions and causes, then we shouldn't be surprised if public support for the scientific community eventually approximates its support for the progressive wing of the Democratic Party. That it's an important point because th that it is clear as I look at how the science around or the media reporting around climate, it, it definitely hews to one preferred position. And it includes ideas around renewable energy siting, which is something I've written a lot about. So, but... How do you boil this down? I mean, I, I got to the point you say this bluntly, we're eroding the faith of science. Is this inevitable? Is this something that's just the, the, the end of a long term trend? How do you put this into context over a decadal uh, uh, time frame rather than just the last few years? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot to unpack here. And of course, a really fascinating and interesting story here. But really, the in the United States, um, the scientific community, and by the scientific community, I generally mean people in academia, government labs, and so on. There's, of course, a lot of scientists in industry and so on. Um, but, you know, those who who do the, the most of the work on publishing and so on are in, in academia funded by government money. And, and um, what would maybe public facing science, right? Instead of in exactly. within corporations, right? right? Okay, yeah. Yeah. I mean, a lot of folks in corporations have their views in politics also, but um, they're, you know, they don't have academic tenure and they're not out right. there. And so um, so that's what I generally mean when I say that. But but it was really about 20 years ago. I mean, it was really um, during the, the first Bush um, administration, um, George Bush, uh, George W. Bush um, in the early 2000s, um, when the scientific community started being more openly partisan in the sense of favoring 
um, you know, Democratic political candidates, John Kerry in particular, received the endorsement um, of of scientists. There was a Nobel Prize winner sign on letter endorsing Kerry. Um, and there was this idea that the scientific community could wield some political influence um, to try to influence, you know, big time presidential politics. And that, um, and that it should, right? And that that's the key part, right? That not only right. that it could, but that it should weigh in. Right. Well, and I think both, both you know, the could and the should are, are highly questioned. Let me flash forward. The motivation for my piece with Matt Burgess um, was a recent study that was released in a nature journal, which looked at the if the, the public opinion consequences of nature, so one of the big two scientific journals, um, endorsing Joe Biden in 2020. And what they found, and this is, you know, public opinion polling, so it's empirical research, they found that, you know, the first finding was that the endorsement didn't bring people around to vote for Joe Biden. And the second big finding is that people, particularly on the right, um, decided they couldn't trust nature anymore. And it actually, the endorsement added to contributed to the polarization of the public to the extent that people were aware of it um which is you know really the opposite of, of what that endorsement was intended to do um but then when that study came out nature followed it up and said um yeah we saw that study but we're still going to endorse candidates going forward um and so you know it's a, it's a kind of an ironic moment because the scientific community often criticizes people who won't get vaccinated or deny climate change and so on because they get evidence and then they don't change their behavior. Well, here's some evidence that what nature did was pathological politically. And they said, well, we're not going to change our behavior either. So so for us, it was it was a, a, a good moment to, to talk about, well, what are the consequences of partisan science and the scientific community becoming more active in electoral politics? Well, the other part of this that to me is really interesting, and I, I uh, have watched the, I was in Japan, uh, you know, in, in, in February and March, and they were still wearing masks, the Japanese, right. uh, overwhelmingly in, in public, even outside. And, you know, I'm not a fan of the whole mask thing, and I've been vaccinated, but I thought, well, why are these people doing this outside, right? What is going on here? But there's a different culture in Japan, right, about this kind of we take care of each other and we want everyone else. But but it, it, there's a cultural issue here as well. And you talk about the, you know, the, the lockdowns and mask mandates in your piece in the Heterodox Academy, again, which was called Partisan Science is Bad for Science and Society, um, which I think is heterodox.org. Is that the, the website? Yep. Yeah. Um, but you point out that, uh, that despite the, there was a, a, a healthy debate at the beginning of the pandemic in, the, in, in 2020, that was emerging that was quashed that was really there was a there was a lot of groupthink that was happening and you say and you wrote and this is really important i think subsequent research suggests that long-term school closures had devastating effects on learning especially among disadvantaged students and jurisdictions and and jurisdictions such as sweden and florida that followed the advice of reopening schools earlier did not suffer greater overall pandemic mortality but had much better educational outcomes um i wrote this question so are we losing our faith altogether? I mean, is this the discrediting of science and the discrediting of our politicians, of our public institutions? It all seems to be happening at once where we're not able, we're, we're, the, the, I read it as kind of a, a loss of belief generally. And I see it even in my own family to a certain extent, this loss of belief and faith in the system. Is that, is that, am I getting close to what you're, some of what you're thinking is about? Yeah, I mean, I think that's fair. I mean, if you do look at, at public opinion polls, and it's not just in the United States, but there is a loss of trust and and um, belief in the legitimacy of of organizations, and you know, you know whether that's um, you know public health officials, um, you know whether it's journalism generally, um, or uh, increasingly universities and and uh, academia. Um, and that's a problem because we need we need experts, we need institutions, we need specialized um, um, institutions to to actually help democracy run. So so it is really important. Um, and Matt and I make this argument that um, that the scientific community be viewed and, and as legitimate and trusted by the you know the broad spectrum of of the public who has a, you know very disparate political beliefs. It's and if the scientific community decides well we're going to pick our favorite, then we shouldn't be surprised if everybody who's not in the favorite <laughs> camp decides they don't like us and they don't trust us. And then um, then we're in a world of hurt. 
Well, so is this a natural inclination? I mean, there are many studies that talk about academia, and you've spent your whole life in academia, um, and uh, that your dad was in academia as well. I mean, this is where you were born, you grew up, you've spent your whole career there. How has it changed? One of the questions I had here is well, you've been teaching for a long time now. What, 25 years, something like that? 30 years? How long? Uh, not quite 25. 25 years. Have students changed? Have they changed over that time frame from that? Because I'm going to follow this up with a, with a point about, uh, and I just looked up a Gallup poll about the level of church going among millennials. But have your students changed in terms of their outlook, of their, their belief in institutions? How, have you noticed something in your classrooms? Yeah, I mean, so the students that I have, they're inquisitive, they're smart, they, they are looking for a place where they can be challenged um, and they can express their ideas. And I think they don't always get that in, in academia. Um, you know, one thing I've noticed, um, and I'm at a, you know, University of Colorado, big public school, is that the student population has changed more demographically than intellectually. Um, state schools, uh, like in Colorado, where um, state support has gone down, re increasingly rely on out-of-state tuition. Um, and so we need... Um, you know, again, to be blunt, we need rich out of state families to send their kids to Colorado. And so um, something like in Boulder, you know, in, in a round number, 10 percent of our students are from the top one percent um, of income families. So I do notice that that we have, a um, you know, a more privileged, wealthier class of students, um, less diversity maybe than, you know, 15 or 20 years ago. And so that that does make a challenge for introducing, you know, challenging, difficult topics because the students, um, you know, they, they share a lot of similarities with each other um, and not a lot of experience around the world. And the similarities are class similarities. Yeah. Right. Economic. Right. Economic. Right. And, yeah. and this is one of the divides. But I wanted the other thing that I wrote down here about the this divide, so and, and the class divide concerns me a lot. I mean, we have a very large urban rural divide as well, and that's somewhat some some of that's based on class. But I want to jump back, I'm, uh, jump around here a little bit. But this the 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 other part about this masking, and you point out about sort of long term school closures, and uh, Jordan Peterson had an amazing interview with Jay Bhattacharya, the the Stanford professor who was right. who along with several others, uh, uh, wrote the Great Barrington Declaration about their belief on how the pandemic should be handled by public health officials. And they were ostracized, in many cases right. denigrated by their own people, including at Stanford. Um, but it, it, the thing that to me has become obvious, and I, I say this not as any kind of a partisan, because I'm not, but that the the political parties have become these enforcers of, of, of a kind of a dogma where you have the Democrats in favor of lockdowns, um, and they're in favor of very strong action on climate change. The Republicans are the opposite, opposing lockdowns, opposing masks in many cases, sometimes, sometimes opposing vaccinations. Um, and you call this out in your piece in Heterodox Academy, writing that the pathological politicization of science is a problem regardless of the political agenda being advanced. I like that line, the pathological politicization. But is... <laughs> I mean, I guess I'm coming back to some of these same themes about belief and partisanship that we've got a very divided country, both between urban, rural, believer, non-believer, Democrat, Republican. Is this what you're talking about here is just a manifestation of one other aspect of it? Or is this something deeper? Is How do you see it in terms of the broader culture? Yeah, I mean, I think, and you know, I, I can speak about my community, academia and the scientific community at, at some point. Um, leaders of of this community decided that that they wanted to play big time politics you know and whether it's the rise of social media facebook twitter and so on or the fact that that so many of our issues um that we're grappling with energy policy public health have a scientific element to them um the there was this idea and it's you know you see it we you know we teach things like science communication which didn't exist 20 years ago where we we teach young PhDs and postdocs, you know, go out and change the world. Um, and, you know, the statistic that I share with, with uh, students and, and colleagues and talks, in the United States, there's 60 million adults with a terminal high school degree. In a round number, there's about 5 million people with a terminal PhD. The 5 million are not gonna beat the 60 million in electoral politics. Um, 
And so, and that's out it, of a population of now what 330 million, right? So yeah, and about here, you know what 170 million voters, something like that. Right. And so. and so the the people with a high school degree or less then are roughly a fifth of the population, something like that, right? Right. right. Whereas the the PhDs would be. Well, not quite a hundredth, but something, right. you know, a little bit less than that. You're the mathematician, not me. Right. But so, well, that's interesting. I hadn't thought about it in those terms that you have this, what Joel Kotkin calls the clerisy, right? The the the, uh, the elite academics, elite universities. And I think that's one of the things that I've noticed, particularly when it comes to the climate issue, that there are a very few, and, a, and it is a handful, I would say, very political PhDs at elite universities who are practicing actively cancel culture on issues around climate and trying to shut or trying to silence people who disagree with them. And you've seen this yourself. But is that where does that come from? That motivation, that that desire to because you've been on the receiving end of this. I've only seen it a little bit. You know, I've been blocked on Twitter by a few people, you know, but there's there's the same time this cancel culture, but also a kind of a broadening of the debate and a broadening of the platforms, which we're, we can talk about right. Substack later. But where does that motivation come from? Is there some kind of messianic co complex, messiah complex among these yeah, academics you know, I, I mean, that, that I know better and I'm going to tell right. you what's good for you? So, so, so we, I mean, for better or worse, we, we academics and those of us who dabble in the public intellectual space, we have an outsized impact on public discussions you know pe you know i wrote something about baseball and climate change this week and, and you know showed up in the new york post I, I had nothing to do you know i just put it out on twitter and and so so there has been this concern and it you know was it, and that it was the home run record the, that was the home run records with climate change right that's well this is like climate change is causing home runs we could talk about that in okay. some detail right. it's it's um i'm going to write about it later this week um but there's this idea that that we are so influential that if we let the quote unquote wrong people have a voice, they might have influence out there. And so, you know, really starting about a decade ago or 15 years ago, um, there was, you know, Keith Clore, a journalist coined this term, the science police, the idea that if we police discourse, you know, and a lot of it was around climate change and, you know, we call people deniers, um, we can then limit the public discussion to certain preferred outcomes. And so there have been a lot of bad. I think it's, you know, it's it's tamped down. It's not as crazy as it was. But the idea that if we can if we can close down improper speech, then we can get the, you know, the quote unquote right policy outcomes. I mean, we saw this with COVID and there's a, a deep difference in worldview here. Um, there are people and I'm, I'm one of those people who thinks that democracy is made stronger by diversity of views, public debates, public expression, achieving disagreement. It's fine if there are experts who who have different views on masking or school closings. Um, it's not to prejudge who's right, but but we're all better off by having those debates out in public. So I do think there there has been this moment, and we're still with it to some degree, where where shutting down debate is viewed as you know someone's theory of change. If we only have the good guys talking, then we'll only get good policies. And you know I, I just don't think it works that way, as as we've seen. I mean empirically, um, so you know if. If people see scientists trying to silence other scientists, um, that's not a good look. And it's not, you know, it's not how you build trust in a community. But yet that's exactly what we've seen. And I'll name names here. Michael Mann, uh, 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 Michael, Mark Jacobson from Stanford actually suing his, his, yeah. his critics in court for $10 million. Yeah. I mean, it, it, this unprecedented level of vitriol and, and effort to silence that I've never seen in my lifetime, but... I think that hits close to it that, oh, we can't let the wrong people have the forum. We can't have, let the wrong people talk about these issues. But it, it to me, it's, it, it goes, I mean, we're talking basic U.S. I mean, constitutional foundational principles here about speech and who will be heard. And we're even seeing it play out on Twitter in terms of now, you know, Elon Musk limiting who what can be linked to whether it's Substack. Right. I mean, that's that's not necessarily directly First Amendment, right? It's his. It's good to own right. your own newspaper, I suppose, right? You know, <laughs> you can control right. who gets who gets heard. But it seems to me that this is it lies near the heart of some of the biggest challenges facing the U.S. About, like you said, the ability to achieve dis achieve disagreement. Is there? It, 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 well, let me jump to Substack for a minute because you're putting a lot of effort into Substack as as am I. Is the rise of Substack a reflection of this declining faith in the institutional media, legacy media? How do you see what that rise of that platform? Because you're putting a ton of effort into it. Yeah, I mean, it's really interesting because Substack 
as a platform is decentralized in a way that Twitter is not, Facebook is not. Um, I think, you know, everybody's seen um, on on Facebook, if you write about climate, then, you know, they'll stick a sticker on there that says, right. you know, this, that, or the other thing. Um, Twitter, I, you know, who knows exactly what's going on behind the scene. I, I don't know what to make of the Twitter files thing, but, you know, I'm pretty sure that in my decade on Twitter, um, you know, there've been block lists passed around to try to, you know, not have people see my stuff. My work's been de-emphasized. Substack is interesting because people get to vote with their subscriptions. Right. And, and for me, um, there's clearly a, a, an interest and appreciation for the sort of stuff that I do. One of the most interesting things to me is people subscribe to my um, Substack and then they come in the comments and they want to argue with me, which is great. I mean, it's so it's not just a, a, a you know, a, a coalition of the like minded. Um, I think people are actually hungry for places they can go. They can learn. They can disagree. They can challenge. Um, and so, you know, I think it's an experiment. But for me, Substack has been really a breath of, of fresh air, um, not just, you know, to publish, but also to read other people's views on a, an enormous, you know, every topic under the sun. Um, and I do feel like I get more educated by being exposed to views that I some I agree with, some I disagree with. And I think people think about me and probably you as as writers in the same way. Um, and so Substack is, um, I'm cautiously optimistic, but I think it's a, a really neat innovation in this kind of social media space. Well, and I think, I mean, for me, as I think about it, it's that I'm not using another platform's brand, which is something I've done my whole career, right? I've never had a real job. I've been a reporter right. my whole life, right? But I've always had to publish under someone else's, under their right. platform, right? Where, whereas now the platform is yours, right? And right. you make a spelling error, or whatever, well, mm -hmm. you make a spelling error, right? It's, right. Your, it's on you, right? And so there's a certain level of care and responsibility because if you're careless, and not responsible, you're not going to get positive traction. Right. Um, so, well, that's interesting. So you argue with your own subscribers on your own platform. Yeah, I mean, it, I mean, obviously, if you write about things like climate change, you know, people have a diversity of views, but, but they're you paying know, you, but they're paying you to argue with you. Then I that's, mean, that's right. that. Well, then that I'd be more inclined. My Substack is free right now, but I'm right. I'm disinclined to argue with anybody who's not paying me right. something. Right? right. <laughs> Just like, a, sorry, I don't have time for that. Right. Well, I think, and it's you know, it's different. I mean, it, it's so far. It, it's different than I've seen on Twitter and Facebook and and, and other platform blogs. People have a name, they show up, you know, they have an identity, they have to give their credit card in order to, you know, sign up and be a paid member. And they're much more respectful with each other. They, um, they, they engage in, in disagreements. I have people, you know, who, who in, in the comments who are, you know, we, we need to be net zero by tomorrow. And I have people who say we need to be net zero by never. Um, and I get to watch them engage. And part of it is they want to be part of a community where they can have those discussions. Some of it, I guess, is they would like to interact with me, but um, it kind of takes a life of its own <laughs> um, and, and they, they don't need me. They just need a place where they can go and, you know, have some challenging ideas and then interact with each other. Yeah, well, I, I think it's a, it's and now just in the last few days, uh, Substack has launched Notes, which is, I think, kind of a. I don't know if it's a direct competitor with Twitter, but it is something that is uh, interesting and in the way the format works and, and it's native to Substack. And right. I think they have now something like 35 million subscriptions and, uh, you know, subscribers, 2 million or so are paid. Right. Um, and it's growing and growing pretty rapidly. Um, I see it. And, and I know I asked you this, but I think it's a reflection of the declining trust as we talked about earlier in institutions right and right. that people are locating people that they believe in right. right instead of institutions that they believe in because it's much right. more of a bilateral kind of well i know that guy and i've read his book or his thing he has his own brand i'm going to invest in that because i know that that's a trustworthy to go back to my Enron days, a trusted counterparty, right? You know, they right. talk about their their clients or their, uh, right. you know, their customers, they were counterparties, right? But it's right. trusted counterparties that people know they can interact with and get reasonable information from. Um, but I want to jump back now. I, we're going to jump around a bit here, but I, yep. one of the questions I wanted to put to you about the, in, in, your, in your Heterodox Academy piece you point out the number of disin disinvitations or, or retracted invitations uh, for visiting speakers on campus. And this goes to the, what was the book, The Closing of the American Mind, 
Um, it's on fire. Uh, what is the fire.org? But I came across this database of disinvitations of speakers and they were all disinvitations from the left. And, and one of the, one of the two, well, there were two disinvitations of Riley Gaines. And I want to talk about this because I find this fascinating and equally fascinating and horrifying that Leah Thomas and Riley Gaines has talked about this, that Leah Thomas was this male who declared herself a female and uh, according to Riley Gaines, they were in the locker room. She said, it is a fully intact male competing against us. And she, there's this great, uh, you know, amazing photo of her watching Leah Thomas accept a trophy while they apparently tied at the same exact time in some meet. And Leah Thomas got the trophy and Riley Gaines didn't. And she's standing there looking at, at, at Leah Thomas going, no, wait just a damn minute. And so she's this, as I read it, a un, an unlikely... Uh, spokesperson on on the issue of gender and sports, right? But one who's been personally affected and standing up to be counted, and yet she's being disinvited both by the University of Pittsburgh and San Francisco State. What do you make of this? Yeah, so there's a couple things to say. So one is, you know, as you know, I've been deeply involved in um, issues of gender and sports now for you know over a decade, um, and we could talk about the substance of that. But the more general principle you're raising here um, is that. On university campuses, um, and you know, fortunately, I haven't seen this on my campus, but you know, it's probably one speaker away on any campus. Um, there are efforts to either deplatform or not give voice to a speaker with with you know some politically controversial view on any side of a particular topic. Um, I do think it's more on the left because universities are inhabited by more people on the left. Um, and you know, including students um, who self-select. Um, I saw a recent interesting study that students are increasingly choosing universities either in the South or in California, according to how they view the political orientation of the campus, um, which is an interesting concept itself. But there is this idea, and it goes back to the same thing we talked about, like on Twitter and, and elsewhere, that if you deplatform voices that you find objectionable or on the wrong side of an issue. That makes it more likely that your side is going to, quote unquote, win in politics. Um, and that, to me, is just a flawed theory of how political change actually occurs. Um, it's not because you silence your opposition and, and, and you know, don't allow them to, 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 to speak at a university or write an article. Um, so, so yeah, the, you know, what instead, we said, Riley... instead you, you should be winning or, or, or prevailing on the, the substance, the merits of what your, your arguments uh, that your policy that, yeah, that, you know, that and should, I, I that it, should be the, that should be the case. Right. Yeah. And, and, you know, when, when I have these discussions with people, you know, sometimes people will say, oh, so you're going to allow a Nazi to speak it, you know, <laughs> and, and it, it goes to the very most extreme and we can all, you know, you know, pedophilia, or, you know, we pick your topic, we can all find something that's probably over the line. But, you know, democracy means being very careful where we put those lines. And um, it's very easy to have some slippage there. Um, and, you know, I, I've been disinvited from giving talks before where I was going to say things like, you know, accurately, the U.S. hasn't seen more hurricanes and, and so on. And so I think there's a big difference between talking about different views on gender eligibility in elite sport and hurricanes and climate change from being a Nazi. And so um, I do think that that we have created cultures of intolerance um, in our public spaces for, um, you know, who we're willing to, to listen to, um, who we're willing to, quote unquote, allow speak. And for me, that's problematic. I mean, it's problematic in science, but it's also, I think, problematic for the practice of democracy. Well, but then it, it's problematic in the academy itself, which should be the place for the most robust debate. And yet this seems to be, was it Jonathan Haidt? Was it his book, The Closing in the American Mind? Yep. That that we're not, if you don't allow it on campus, well, where the hell are you going to allow it? Right, right. Well, so then let me ask about Riley Gaines. How do you view her? Because, I, you know, she she's a very appealing kind of, you know, she's blonde and pretty and, you know, she's got an... A, you know, this grievance that she's airing saying, how did we come here? Right. And that's that that's my brief take on what how I've seen. And I haven't d taken a deep dive. I mean, how do you see her as a as a public figure now? Because she has become one and a reluctant one, I think. What, and you've been immersed in the gender politics and of sports for a long time. How do you see her? 
Yeah, I think, I mean, she's she's one of um, a number of very prominent um, female athletes. Martina Naratilova is one of them. Nancy Hogshead Makar is another, um, who are very outspoken in um, their views of, um, you know, what's, you know, biological essentialism, the idea that there are men and there are women and that's it. You can't, we don't, we don't change categories um, in elite sport. And um, my view is that it's a lot more complicated and nuanced um, than that. Um, if you're, if you're in the sport of boxing, then issues like strength and body size um, are a lot important, more important than if you're in archery or shooting. And, you know, to simply say, we're going to ban a class of individuals um, for me is, is probably the wrong way to go. Um, what we want to what we want to address is unfair advantage and unfair advantage is a complicated concept in sport um, and what that actually means. Um, and, you know, can unfair advantages, say, in sprinting be mitigated through testosterone suppression? I don't know. You don't know. Riley Gaines doesn't know because we haven't done the research. So so for me, it's, this is the sort of issue where um, I'm happy, as you know, as John Dewey said, you know, part of thinking well is to exist in a state of uncertainty for a long long time until you get the evidence and sort things out um i don't think we know um the answer to you know what an unfair advantage is in certain sports and disciplines can that advantage be mitigated um through medical interventions um or treatment um and how does it vary across different sports it's going to be different in synchronized swimming from diving from long distance swimming and so on. And so I think everyone needs to take a step back. And I think the problem for sport is that this gets caught up in a bigger cultural, political issue, um, focus on transgender individuals in society. And sport is just just an opportunity to have those politics play out. Um, sport is dealing, you know, in the Paralympics with athletes who run on cheetah blades, dealing with classification issues all the time. It's nothing new, it, you know, it involves a lot of science. Sometimes, it, you know, you go to sleep It's for if you're not really into these issues because it's so boring. Um, but if it wasn't for the hot politics of the cultural issues associated with gender, um, you know, people wouldn't be paying attention to this. I mean, well, I've seen see, talks. But I differ on, there because I think sports is, I mean, this is, a, this is such a, a clear reflection of society, right? It's where we've seen big gains, right? Particularly, uh, you know, in, whether it's uh, uh, Jackie Robinson or, you know, yep. the, you know the, the integration of sports. But this well so let me ask about leah thomas should leah thomas have been allowed to compete as a as a female so i mean this is where you go back to the rules so so one rule that i've proposed um i'm stealing a, a terminology from the world of soccer so the world of soccer has this rule it's called the cap tie rule so a cap like a hat oh right and, yes and, right yeah the cap tie rule is if you play um at an elite level for one country you are tied to that country you cannot then change nationalities. Um, it's a it's a cap tie, um, and I have proposed a cap tie rule for elite sports, whereby if you're a man or a woman and you've competed at an elite level um, in a particular sport, um, you are tied to that gender forever. So for Leah Thomas, if the NCAA had a cap tie rule, then um, Leah Thomas would not have been able to go from the men's swim team at Penn to the women's swim team. And On so the where, other does hand, the, where does the elite that, where does the word elite then kick yeah, in? Yeah, yeah. Is, that, is that age 15? Is that high school? Where do you, so that's, where I mean, do, that's where one of those that... things in regulation. It's a, it's a political question. So where do we want to draw that line? I'm pretty sure it's not in the third grade. Um, <laughs> well, okay. But hey, we can but, agree on that professor. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, and I'm pretty sure it is at the NCAA Level. So college, once 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 you yeah. get to be eighteen, then yeah. or as a freshman in college, yeah. then or that age where you have the potential to be professional, right? Yeah, because usually that's it's where... you know it's what's called senior level competition in sport, right. you know whatever that happens to be. So adult competition at that at that right. level. Right. So well, I'm just thinking about you know at what age do you know athletes go pro? So I mean there right. are a few a few exceptions. You know Moses Malone, maybe I went he went pro at seventeen yeah, 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 yeah. or. or LeBron James, yeah. Um, LeBron or, you know, but that set, the cutoff would be age right. 17, 18. But, but here's where it's, I mean, this is where people get, get upset about a rule like that. So if Leah Thomas had never swam at the NCAA level as, uh, as a man um, and came in, 
uh, you know, it, under that rule, she would have been eligible, in my view, to compete on the women's team because um, she hadn't competed at a high level on the uh -huh. men's team. So, so it's the same person, um, same characteristics, just a different story how they got to where they're going. Um, you know, there's other potential rules we could talk about. And, you know, there's a lot of talk about testosterone suppression and does it actually mitigate performance or does it not? Um, and again, I, you know, it, it's going to be different in but running. That's a hard, but that's, for, that gets kind of gray in terms of that, whereas the cap ties are much more of a, of right. a, of a clearer demarcation line right. where it would be much easier to enforce without syringes and, you know, right. all kinds of testing and blah, so blah. In my blah. view, a cap tie rule takes care of like 98% of the controversial cases um, on this issue. Um, and I know there's a lot of transgender activists who don't like the idea of a cap tie rule. Um, but, you know, it, it's all negotiable. But I, I think you will have a hard time finding. I mean, one thing people don't understand is that elite women are out of this world athletes yeah and and you're not gonna i mean just because you know i i have xy chromosome doesn't mean i can compete with a elite woman in anything right. um and so the idea that a man is going to change genders and all of a sudden be able to compete with elite women without ha having been some sort of an elite male competitor um to me it's it's kind of ridiculous people just don't understand how 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 phenomenal these women are and you know gaining entry to that is not easy um, and it's not determined just by your chromosomes. Right. Well, um, well, let me ask you, Uni University of Colorado, you, you've been your, there your whole career since we're on sports right now. So uh, what's your prediction for the Colorado Buffaloes football team this year with Deion Sanders coming in and arguably one of the most high profile, I mean, there have been a lot of high profile coaches, coaching changes in recent yeah. years, but Deion Sanders <laughs> brings a different kind of flavor in this. And I've, you know, I've watched him and I've become a fan, right? And him, he's one of the, as, a, as, a, as an athlete in sports, he was one of the most compelling, one of the fastest individuals ever to play right. professional sports. Is he going to change things at Colorado? Has he already changed things? What's your perception? So, so, and this is all colored by NIL, right? Which is, yeah, which is yeah. a whole nother kind of a, where this much more professionalism of the college right. game than we've ever seen before that he yeah. can essentially create his own draft and bring players with him and so on. But I just wanted to add that because that's the other part here that I think makes this a, a different story than what we've seen before. Yeah. I mean, what I think Dion is doing is, is he's, he's laying bare, making it inescapable, the mercenary nature of big time college, college. sports and <laughs> um and and you know so so who knows what's going to happen this year or next year um i don't you know i he might be here in four years but he might not be and you know this the 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 story for the university of colorado is you know what happens after everybody enjoys this fun ride right he brings in some some athletes they're here for a year two years maybe um maybe they get some nil money maybe they don't but when he goes away they go away and you know colorado's back to where they where they were so it's it's a really i mean and we do this with grad students and and other students too you know i, I mentioned you know we, we recruit rich out-of-state students um you know colleges are pretty mercenary places they do that with faculty and you know whoever can bring in the most money but it, he's making it clear and obvious that you know it, it's not you know it, it's not whatever people's picture of an you know idealized you know, college football <laughs> Fridays at the stadium with the student athletes who, you know, are in, you know, calculus the day before, and then they show up. But it's not like that. I mean, it's a, a fully professionalized endeavor, which is fine. Um, but I, you know, Sanders is making that inescapable. That the, that this, this cloak of the student athlete, at, at least in division one is over, right? That this it's, is, yeah. Not I mean, it's been over for a long time, but now it's, it's inescapable. It, it's, it's obvious. And it's, you know, more power to them if they can make some money. And, you know, eventually I'm sure there'll be employees and they'll make a lot of money, um, particularly at, you know, places like Alabama and Ohio State, maybe not Colorado. Um, but good for them. And they should because they work hard. It's a job. And um, Sanders is just revealing that, that we have, a, a you know, another professional sports league and it's Division One college football, which is fine. Well, well, and it's interesting, though, but uh, who was the star of the Iowa Hawkeyes? Caitlin... Um... Oh, she was their star player. She was in the, they were in the finals and lost to LSU. Um, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Um, 
Yeah, rumors the, that she uh, she was going to make a million do- a million dollars right this year. And I mean, one of the players that's been recruited to play at the University of Texas, uh, Archie Manning's grandson, I think they he was going to come in as a freshman, making right. at the University of Texas, uh, maybe not even as a starting quarterback, potentially making a million dollars a year. I mean, this has fundamentally changed the economics of the whole game, and I'm not I, I i don't know that i'm opposed to it i think these kids are you know they're talented why shouldn't they get paid let's 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 right. why is the coach making 10 million dollars and they're making you know they're getting a, a box you know a, 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 a you know a bottle of gatorade and some nike shoes i mean this isn't a fair deal right right but it is much more mercenary now than ever yeah well i don't know you take a look at you know college basketball and the <laughs> you know recent uh scandal caitlin, Cla- caitlin clark isn't that right yeah is that her name? yeah okay. yeah caitlin clark at uh, Iowa. Um, but you take a look at college basketball. I mean, there's been money changing hands for a long time. But part of it is, I mean, this is just an economic, I mean, it, college, and it's, a, it's an amazing story. College sports in the United States are a fully socialized endeavor. They are, they are completely controlled from the top down. Um, you know, there's something like 65 teams in the Power Five conferences, which means there's 65 head coaches. And so if there's more money from TV contracts and so on going into athletic departments, that money has to go somewhere. And if you prevent the workers, the athletes from getting compensated, of course, coaches salaries are going to explode and and go through the roof because it's a, you know, it's, it's, it's a marketplace that is completely top down controlled and limited, um, you know, a lot of barriers to entry. And, you know, once athletes start getting paid, you're going to see coaches salaries, stop going through the roof because you got to pay the talent. Uh, that's interesting. I hadn't thought about it in those terms, but yeah, right. It is a very constrained market where the, with big barriers to entry and only a few people, a few dozen will be considered for those plum jobs. Um, let me go back to this issue about, you know, science um, and uh, about this, the politicization of science. And uh, I, as, as I was reading your piece in heterodox um, uh, that we started talking about the piece that you wrote with the, uh, uh, Matt Burgess um, called partisan science is bad for science and society. Is this politicization of science just a, another example of politicization that we see in sports politicization that we see in religion, right? Because I've, I've, I've listened to, uh, I'm, I'm listening to Jordan Peterson. I don't listen to many other podcasts. I listened to some of his, he had a very interesting discussion with Vivek Ramaswamy, who of course is running for president. And, and Jordan Peterson said that, uh, uh, he said, for the left now, climate is replacing Christ, right? That the activism around climate change is replacing traditional religious uh, affiliations. Is, so is, the question is, is, the politicization of science with regard to this kind of belief system, because it is a belief system, just as religion is a belief system, is that politicization inevitable? That because it is a church, in a sense, that it's inevitable that the church would be politicized, that, that, that this would happen? Yeah, you know, I, I think, you know, to, to some degree, science has, you know, it's a reflection of the broader society. Um, but, you know, in talks I give when I talk about the politicization of science, there's there's good survey data from the 1950s and 1960s that looked at the political leanings of, of academics. And um, people in the humanities have always tended to be more on the left, um, but the social scientists and, and natural scientists, <clears throat> excuse me, um, in in the 50s and 60s, we're much more evenly balanced than you see today. And so I do think that there is a long-term trend. And it, it, this is not necessarily by itself a bad thing. I mean, if you look at the military, you know, most people in the military lean more towards the right. And that doesn't, I mean, the military still functions really well. Um, and so, but I do think that there's been a failure of leadership in academia, in science, um, and I think there's this rush. It's it's gone, to, you know, to some degree to people's heads that you know, oh, I'm in charge of a big journal or I'm leading a scientific society. Maybe I have political influence. Maybe I have political power. Um, the reality is, you probably don't, because <laughs> for a lot of reasons. But I mean, you know, there's a reason why science informs decisions and doesn't make decisions. Um, so I do think that that the leaders of the scientific community in the last couple decades have gotten a little bit too. Um, heady, the idea that they're, you know, instead of serving society, we're going to lead society. We're going to help people to make what we think are the right decisions. And democracies don't work like that. Um, so 
Um, I do think that that we've lost a sense of purpose in academia. Um, I think this has happened in journalism also, where we see a lot of activist journalists. Um, and I mean, just just you know, as as I mentioned it earlier, when when the study came out, um, you know, a few weeks ago about the impact of nature's endorsement of Biden, um, the the editor in chief of Science, so Science is the other big journal. Um, he said, well, it's it's right that that the scientific community endorsed candidates because the public doesn't even want science. This is what he put out on Twitter. Um, they just want information that confirms their beliefs. And it was such a disdainful, haughty view of, you know, his view of an ignorant public um, that it's, to me, it spoke volumes for, you know, what's wrong with with the scientific community. Um, if we look down on the public as getting in the way of making good decisions, I mean, that's just a wholesale rejection of the demo of how democracies actually work, because the public is in charge, not us. You know, when you said that, what popped into my head was uh, so I, I wrote a piece a long time ago on Karl Rove when George W. Bush uh, was running for president. Right. Not George H. W. Bush. So it was yep. the, the elder um, George yep. W. was running for governor. And I remember interviewing Karl Rove back then. And now this is, gosh, 30 years ago. Um, talking about the importance of political operatives like him, political consultants. And he said something that stuck in my head. He said, well, you're assuming the masses are asses. And I never heard that, right? But that, that, right. that line, right, that the masses are asses, that they don't know what's good for them. But the other thing that popped in my head when you were talking about that is this idea that then the scientist as priest, right, as the scientist, right. as if science is replacing religion, right, as a institution, right, as a church, then right. the leaders of those churches are priests. They are the, and you see this with some of the climate alarmists. And, I, you know, one uh, uh, Jeff Gibbs on the podcast a few years ago called uh, Bill McKibben, the environmental Jesus, right? Which, I, I mean, as I see some of the way that, and McKibben has, was going to be on the podcast. He's delayed it now two more months. I don't know whether he's ever going to actually come on the podcast. I was supposed to interview him on April 10th. Uh, on April 7th, uh, he had someone write me saying, oh, no, he's sick or he's in something. He can't do it. How about late June? And I'm thinking, OK, well, is this ever going to happen? Uh, right. who, who knows? Right. But he's kind of the one of the priests of this climate movement, climatism, I would call it. Yeah. Yeah. But is that does that ring true to you that the, these that they have become a certain select few? And, and McKibben is an academic as well. He has a, a job at Middlebury that these academics view themselves as priests and they have a flock that they are going to lead to their certain preferred outcome, just as a priest in, in a religious affiliation would. Does that, am I, does that make any sense to you? Yeah, there is. I mean, there's, there's a great article. It's by a, 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 an academic named Michael Barkin from, I think it's 1983. So 40 years ago, um, talking about um, the rhetoric of the apocalypse in, in U S culture hmm. and how, at some point, we went from talking about a religious apocalypse to a secular apocalypse. And the secular apocalypse is governed by computer models that predict the future and experts who make pronouncements. Um, but it still fulfills some of the same societal functions as the religious apocalypse did. Um, and I think it is, um, you know, again, for some elements of you know the climate movement, um, that that climate has become a reductionist totalizing kind of worldview um it's not everybody i mean you can view climate as very much a technological problem that has a technological solution like a lot of other things out in, like you know like vaccines and other things in society but like a lot of things that are really complicated um, and help people to explain the world whether it's natural disasters or home runs or whatever you know climate is available there it is well you know it's warm out in boulder today that's climate change or you know, so this, this so this helps explain extinction rebellion and just stop oil that these are the followers of this apocalyptic worldview for some I, I think that's a fair statement not again not everybody in the climate movement but i do think in a lot of the vocal um participants and it, it you know it gives meaning and purpose where um where it didn't exist before to people so i get it i understand and you know it's not you know it's not just climate there's other issues in society that fulfill that role but climate is certainly one of them um and, but, it rhymes, you know, and, it mimics, and it mimics some of those traditional Christian, you know, beliefs around sin and redemption and for you sure. Know, and, and absolutely and, that the, they change your lifestyle and repent and believe and, you know, the, the world will be a better place. You know, the, the challenge is climate change is real. It's serious. Um, there's a lot of policies that make sense. So 
how to separate out um, you know, the technological, the policy aspects for, of a real issue from those who would turn it into some sort of, you know, reductionist, totalizing explanation for everything in the world. Um, I mean, I think that's where it gets really complicated these days. One of the things that, uh, oh, I was just looking for the, I want to talk about one thing we've talked about many times, and I stole this idea from you, as I told, you know, confessed many times that uh, uh, John Lennon and Pablo Picasso have been attributed this uh, uh, amateurs borrow professional steel. So I stole the idea of the iron law of climate and coined the iron law of power density and also the iron law of electricity. But now the iron law of climate is 10 years old, 12 years old now, something like that. Yeah, 13 years. 13 years. Um, I, th I thought of it a few weeks ago because the International Energy Agency released its latest report, CO2 emissions in 2022. Uh, here are the key quotes. Global energy <laughs> CO2 emissions grow 0.9%, reaching a new high of 36.8 gigatons. CO2 from coal rose, CO2 from emission from oil rose. The biggest sectoral increase came from electricity and heat generation, where emissions were up by 1.8%. Um, and then they also published a telling graphic showing that over the last 20 years, CO2 emissions are just showing this relentless increase. Um, comment for me, if you would, just on the iron law of climate, because I... It seems to you know, what's my takeaway from the IEA numbers and what all we've seen with the Inflation Reduction Act and efforts at climate mitig you know, mitigation that, yeah, we can spend a lot of money on mitigation, but the reality is we're going to have to spend a lot more and a lot more focus and a lot more public acceptance of the reality of climate adaptation. Is that, does that ring true to you? Yeah, I mean, so the iron law of climate change is an economic concept. It's the idea that, you know, people around the world are willing to spend something for climate environmental benefits but that willingness is limited um, which seems like a kind of an obvious sort of observation but it, it's interesting that um, people have debated it for for a while i mean it's like you know in in france with the yellow vest protests that was only over a few euro cents increase in the price of petrol um, when when people usually on the right they they come out and they say well you know climate policies are going to cost 50 trillion dollars it's going to make everybody's electricity bills go up I don't worry too much about those things because people aren't going to let that happen. Um, I mean, if, if you want to, you know, mobilize people politically, then increase their energy costs. Um, mm. and, and there will be a quick corrective that comes, you know, and that's going to happen in Europe. It's going to happen in Asia. It's going to happen everywhere because um, people don't like higher price energy because energy is a basic input cost to everything, you know, including food, um, transportation and so on. So, People notice. And I mean, in the United States, it plays out, you know, when the price of gasoline, even though the gasoline intensity of, of, of economic activity has gone down significantly over decades, um, it's a very public representation of energy costs. And when it gets up to four dollars a gallon in the United States, um, the president feels like he has to do something about it. Um, and, whether and, he can and, or and, not, and that's it? partly a reflection of the fact that those prices are available yeah. and are on billboards. I was driving right. the other, and the price was in three foot high letters. Right, right? it was three. Right. You know, it's like right. you cannot miss. I don't know right. what I paid for milk the last time, but I know I paid three dollars and fifteen cents per gallon right. for the last gallon of gasoline I bought. Right. Um, so it's a very public understanding of that. But, you know, I well, the way I explain the iron law of climate is that when forced to choose between economic growth and, and, and action right. on climate, economic growth will win every time, right? That policymakers yeah. are not going to take action on climate over economic growth. And that you, you put it at the policymaker level. I think, you know, what I did with electricity is just saying people aren't going to sit in the dark. They're going to do whatever right. they have to do because they they don't like sitting in the dark. They know yeah. what electricity brings. Um, so, but back to the adaptation then, because this is also one of the, become one of the words that's, as I view it, kind of one of, oh, you're not supposed to talk about that because we have to, we have to reduce, have to cut, have to, re, you know, we have to spend trillions, right? We have the Inflation Reduction Act, which, you know, now the cost could be not 370 billion, but in fact, maybe 4X that according to Goldman Sachs, that this cost of this effort at mitigation was ballooning, but may, in fact, if you look at just the IEA numbers, because the U.S. numbers aren't really that important anymore right. in terms of the overall global numbers, that they're being swamped by the growth of CO2 emissions in the rest of the world. Is that, how do you see that? Am I on the, does that make sense to you when I have repeated what I see? Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's my view very much is that the world has, and I, I, I coined this term, you know, three, four years ago, but we're, we're entering a long plateau in emissions. 
So mm-hmm. if you look at economic growth and you look at, you know, sure, India, China, maybe Indonesia are, are expanding coal production, um, but maybe they're not. I mean, it's it's um, I was just in India for uh, several weeks and, you know, it's a incredible country quickly growing. They need energy. They need electricity. They're going to get it if they have to from coal. But um, if you look at what's happening around you know, in the rest of the world, in the United States and Europe, um, coal's going down. And so we're kind of at a, you know, it's not clear to me who's going to win out uh, going forward. And if, if natural gas replaces coal, um, we can have a lot of increasing energy consumption without a lot of emissions growth. So we'll see where, where that winds up. Deep decarbonization is a huge century long challenge. So I view policies like the Inflation Reduction Act um, as experiments. Um, yeah, a lot of money is going to get moved around. There's going to be a lot of winners and losers. There's going to be a lot of lobbyists who love that sort of, you know, <laughs> largesse that's that's granted. Um, and then, you know, in five years, we're going to know if it worked or it didn't work. And then, you know, I, I, I have very publicly said that, you know, on emissions reductions, take the under. I don't think it's going to hit anywhere close to the Biden administration goal of you know, 100% decarbonization of electricity sector by 2035 or the 50 to 52% overall right. economy wide reduction by 2030. Um, and, and let me interrupt you there because I've yep. seen that claim and I've heard John Kerry make that claim and oh yeah, we're going to, we're going to completely decarbonize the electric grid right. and we're going to do it by 2035. I mean, I, yeah, like you, I'm, you know, I'm, I, I, I can only do basic arithmetic and the most basic kind of spreadsheets and the most basic kind of PowerPoints, but I'm just look at the numbers and I think, why are you saying this? There is absolutely no chance, none, zero. Uh, you know, as my father used to say, this, uh, chances are slim and none and slim left town. It is not going to happen. Right. And yet they they are compelled to keep repeating that claim. And I'm wondering why? I mean, what? why would they continue to say that when there's the network simply does, can't change that fast. The system, they can't change that fast. Right. Is it that well, just this, pure politics? Why, why did that, why does that rhetoric in this administration more than any that I know of repeat such a claim that's so obviously unattainable? There's a, there's a larger dynamic going on that I see in, in climate policy and climate politics. And that's, that's a, a reduction in the, in the time frame for promises. We're almost, we're not there yet, we're almost to the time frame of political accountability. So it used to be, all right, we're going to reduce emissions by, you know, 80% by 2080. And then it was 50% by 2050. Um, now we're talking 2035, 2030. Um, you know, Joe Biden's not going to be president in 2030. Um, it, But we're getting close to where um, the promises made by, if the Biden administration has a second term, we're going to know if their promises are are on target or not. And so that's a I think that's a healthy new development, you know, over the last decade in climate politics is that we're getting much closer to reconciling commitments and promises with timescales of democratic elections. Um and and so I think we're going to see a lot more realism and pragmatism in climate politics going forward. That's my hope, but I also it's my expectation as people realize that it's not just virtue signaling, it's not just you know long-term promises made by politicians who will be long gone in 2050 or 2080. Um, and, and that's the only way we're gonna drive more realistic targets, timetables and, and policies. Um, and I, I think we're, it, you know, I, for me, that's a positive sign because again, again, the public's not gonna, gonna allow the lights go out, not gonna allow their you know, gasoline to go up to nine or $10 a gallon. They're not gonna, you know, so, so I, I think it's a really interesting period between now and 2030 in, in climate policy because it, it's it's you know it's becoming climate policy is becoming real, not just a talking point. So, is adaptation still a dirty word? Adaptation is, um, I mean, one of the great success stories, and you know, we could do a whole episode on this. Is um, over the last hundred years, the the decrease in um, deaths from um, natural disasters overall, but you know, particularly weather and climate. Um, the, the decrease in the number of people affected, even as, you know, we've exceeded 8 billion people on the planet. Um, the, the world has never been as safe a place for humans with respect to, you know, craziness of weather and climate ever in the entire history of humankind. Um, and that's a success story that's due to a lot of things like building infrastructure, becoming wealthier, um, but also forecasts, warnings, satellites, communication, the Internet. 
Um, air, it's an incredible air, air, story. Air conditioning, heating, yeah. better mobility, yeah. better buildings, all of these. And things. that, and, and not everyone, you know, has those benefits. But it, it, but I mean, if you just look at Southeast Asia, you look at you know India, Bangladesh, and tropical cyclones, you know, typhoons in that region. It was not uncommon in the 1960s for tens of thousands of people to die every single year um, from from poorly forecasted or because they didn't know because they didn't know it was coming. Right, and you know people were in very vulnerable, low lying places. Um, and today, the same you know storm of the same magnitude, um, you know, it, it there are still large disasters, but much much less frequently than there was back then. I mean, this is a huge success story of science and technology that I think people are afraid to talk about because how to reconcile improved adaptation with visions of climate apocalypse um, is a difficult thing for for people to, to to put forward at the same time. So they just don't talk about the adaptation successes. And the catastrophe and the catastrophes went out or get would dominate because it's much more it's an easier story to tell or one that's... everybody loves to talk about catastrophe. It's so let's talk about that since IPCC and we're close to an hour already, Roger, and I don't want to keep you too long. My guest again is Roger Pilkey Jr. You can find him on Substack, Roger Pilkey Jr. Substack.com. He's the honest broker on Substack. You wrote a lot recently on your Substack uh, about Roger Pilkey Jr. Substack.com. Um, about the IPCC report, which was yet another example of what I would say alarmism. And you criticized it severely. Um, you said uh, in, uh, on your Substack that uh, the IPCC, quote, made several misleading claims related to tropical cyclones. The IPCC's failures are both obvious and undeniable. I will walk you through them in detail. And then you go on. Mistakes can creep into massive assessments to be sure, but the failures I document below are absolutely unacceptable. And you talk about the one uh, that they made a significant error in terms of the attribution on cyclones. Can you summarize that fairly quickly for us? Yeah, I mean, the IPCC. So let me just first say IPCC is really important. I mean, we need a body to assess tens of thousands of climate science papers. Um, um, the problem now, as I see it with the IPCC, is that you need to be an expert to be able to go into the report and separate out the good stuff from the bad stuff. It should all be good stuff. Um, it should all be solid and, and well done. And in this case, um, there's a few errors, but the big one was that they misinterpreted a paper that um, was looking at hurricanes. Um, and it was a study of observations of hurricanes. It wasn't a study of hurricanes themselves. Somewhere in the game of telephone, um, the IPCC confused an observation of a hurricane with a hurricane. Um, which is a you know it's a basic mistake. It would in a in an elementary meteorology course you'd you know get sent back to redo your analysis, um, but it persisted and it made its way all the way to the summary for policymakers in the synthesis report. So it became one of the most important findings: um, the idea that there are more intense hurricanes as a proportion of all hurricanes. Um, and if you look at the data, which you can do in ten minutes, just Google it. Um, it's not true. And so for me, an error of that magnitude, which, you know, and I put that out a couple of weeks ago, no one's complained or said I got the analysis wrong, um, which they would have, if, I'm sure, if if I had gotten something wrong, it's so obvious. Um, it's a failure in the basic processes of peer review and evaluation of the IPCC, which shouldn't happen. So for me, I, you know, I say the IPCC needs to exist, but it needs to be reformed so that we can trust it. Um, because not everyone is going to be an expert in the IPCC. Otherwise, we wouldn't need it. Um, and it shouldn't allow errors like this to creep in. And, you know, and since I published mine, there's been a number of other people, um, Patrick Brown at the Breakthrough Institute, who was, uh, you know, who went through and published another series of errors made in Working Group 2. Um, for, for an organization that claims to be the most authoritative peer-reviewed assessment body in the world, that shouldn't happen. Well, and it seems like this is just an echo of what we've discussed now for the last hour, that this politicization, that this lack of precision, this lack of accountability, because I'm assuming the IPCC has not issued a correction, right? Yeah. That this is part and parcel of this broader kind of, again, a catastrophist mindset that, oh, and what was it? I, I forgot the uh, Antonio Guterres said uh, the alarm yeah. bells are ringing, right? That this was another report where the media uh, legacy media reports generally said yeah see there you go we got to make radically redo society dramatically cut hydrocarbon use all the things that aren't happening should happen and now here's yet more proof 
but yet the, the, the fundamental basis of those claims was flawed, and yet there's no accountability in that system either. And so again, are we going back to where we started about declining faith in institutions and the fact that we're, our faith is declining for a reason because they're, because they're yeah. becoming less trustworthy? Yeah, I mean, this, I mean, you get to the nub of what is one of the most insidious consequences of the politicization of science. Science, I mean, we all make mistakes. I make mistakes. IPCC makes mistakes. It's fine. It, it happens. But what, what science has a unique claim to is that it is supposed to be self-correcting over time. We put our data out there. Somebody else does the analysis. If we did it wrong, they will correct it. And over time, we get better and we get smarter on these things. The politicization of science is a problem when it short circuits that self-correction process. And so if the IPCC or individual scientists are afraid to speak out, to say, oh, here's an error, let's fix it, because they're worried about the political consequences. You know, what will the UN say? What will the climate skeptics say? Um, so we're not, we're not going to correct it. We're not even going to acknowledge that there was an error made. Then that's a problem for science because that that then defeats the strongest part of science, which is self-correction. So this is what the attitude is. We're just going to brazen it out, right? That this is something that I've seen in newspapers, right? In the New York Times or the Washington Post or others that, right. you know, they make a fundamental error. I mean, I saw this in, you know, when the, you know, attribution by a Washington Post reporter to work done by Mark Jacobson, in fact, after he'd sued, no mention of his slap suit, no mention. Right. And then they just, well, they just brazened it out, right? Well, we're not right. going to acknowledge that. We're not going to acknowledge any of that. No correction. Or they'll make a correction and not acknowledge them. They made a correction, which I saw with the New Yorker as well. I mean, they're just things like this that seem to me are undermining this overall faith in institutions. So like the last few questions. And so uh, you, you work with Matt Burgess. You, uh, I think you featured as well, one of your former uh, students, uh, oh, Jessica Wank Wankel is her Jessica Winkle. Yeah. Winkle at, at the university of North Carolina, Charlotte, who I saw testified before a Senate committee fairly recently about uh, how uh, climate finance is being affected by climate reporting, which I thought was an interesting I I issue that, uh, yeah. In fact, I'm going to be writing about because of uh, Jamie Dimon's recent uh, uh, points about using eminent domain to seize land for wind and solar projects, which is a whole nother set of discussions. But who's worked on on these issues? Do you admire? Yeah, let me say, I mean, Jessica Winkle, she's at North Carolina Wilmington. She she just started up her own sub stack. Um, look her up. Super smart. And she's going deep into climate and finance. Um, some really interesting things. Um, Patrick Brown um, at the Breakthrough Institute has he's been active on Twitter and he's been writing a lot of things. He's a climate scientist um, and has bravely taken on some of these issues um, where people often would just prefer, you know, just be silent. Don't 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 rock the boat. Um, I do think that the climate beat um, in journalism is problematic because people earn their salaries by emphasizing stories that that magnify climate. Um, and I think this climate in baseball, um, you know, it's, it's an interesting little paper that was in Bolton American Meteorological Society. And, you know, taking at face value, they said they can attribute, you know, you know, 0.04 percent of home runs to climate change. All right. That's fine. But then you have the Washington because, Post. Because the temperature is higher and that it because then it's uh, it changes it the air the density ball, in the ball, the ball you know, carry further. Right. Right. OK. Um, and I'll, I'll be writing about this. I mean, take it at face value. It's fine. But, you know, if you take it at face value, what it says is that, well, climate change really isn't that important in an era of raised stitches on baseballs and steroids and stronger um, pitchers and stronger hitters and analytics and bat swing angle. So um, but instead, the stories are written that, oh, climate change is going to change baseball over the next century. And so I think the incentives we've created by by creating a quote unquote climate beat means that we have to magnify right. climate change in all of our discussions. Um, and, you know, in, in some cases, it's really, really important. But in others, it's just not. And that's OK. Yeah, we're alarmed. Well, I'll put it a different way that the alarmism is rewarded. Right. Yeah. That, you know, it goes back to, well, maybe it was your line or someone else, but no, nobody ever got elected by saying things are going to be just fine. Right. right. You know, it's the other right, guy's right. going to mess up the right, world. Right, 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 right. OK, so the last two questions, Roger, uh, what books are you reading now? What do you got on your what's on your list that's at the top of the pile? So I just read um, a book about um, Escape from Model Land, uh -huh. um, which is a fascinating book. Um, forgot the author's name, Erica. It'll come to me. Um, but she's at uh, in in the UK. 
Um, and it's 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 an excellent book for non-experts, but also for modelers. And and the, the escape from modeling is that that we we believe that we um, can capture the world in computer models, but sometimes we confuse the computer model for the real world. Uh -huh. And so it's easy to get our heads into the. And she talks a lot about COVID models and climate models, um, economic models, and and her advice is, you know, how do we how do we escape from from model land um, and realize that models aren't the real world. And, you know, where she winds up is expert judgment. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's frustrating and unsatisfying, but it's, I think it's real. It's that, you know, there is no, no algorithm or formula to, to escape from, from model land and models are, you know, controlled that ultimate, pretty much. That ultimately you're going to have to have somebody who's a, 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 you know, a wise head, a gray head, right. somebody who has experience to say, okay, well, uh, you know, it's interesting. I was, it was just one quick point. I was met a guy at a recent. It was a wedding. He's a former Marine pilot, and uh, he uh, uh, helicopters. And he said yep. that, uh, oh well, you know, there was a helicopter, and, and one of the guys, one of the deckhands, said, well, there's something wrong with that plane. It doesn't or that that aircraft doesn't sound right. And <clears throat> the the this guy, he was a Marine officer. He gets the pilot on the deck and says, well, you got a problem. You need to shut it down now. And the pilot says, no, everything's fine. And and, and, the, and he said, no it's not fine. It doesn't sound right. We have to stop now. And they'd found out the engine was in fact damaged. Right. And so, but it was that experience of this guy had 5,000 right. hours or something like that. But right, it was right. that, no, there's a certain point where you have to make a judgment, but it harkens back to this point that we talked about earlier about the rise of Substack, the rise of the individual journalist right. in a way that now people are, or individual writers are deplatforming themselves and saying, well, you know, you can trust me and here's where yeah. I'm going to be. And this is what I, 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 that, that, that makes sense to me. So my last question, you know, what's coming. It's uh, what gives you hope? You know, I'm, uh, and you've just I'm been around optimistic. the world, by the way, right? You've just been traveling. For I've been on, well, yeah, I've been on sabbatical for the last, I mean, it's, it's coming to an end, sadly. Um, and I've been to like 17 countries on five different continents and, um, you know, all, all, the last, all in the last two months or so, right? Well, in the last fall, I was in Europe. I was I was in Norway. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. And, you know, just seeing people around the world busting their asses, working hard, trying to make life better for themselves. And I got to meet and talk to an enormous range of people from, you know, people in Cambodia who were cooking on, you know, with fire um, to, you know, a billionaire in Norway. Um, and and I am I am encouraged by just you know how good people are um yeah there's a lot of crap out there and we see a lot of things on the news that are, aren't great but boy overall you know people are great and um so i'm i'm pretty optimistic about the future um you know it's 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 going to be a hard slog you know people fight with each other and they don't like each other but at the same time there's a lot of good and a lot of good people out there so so for me you know this sabbatical has been great it's been reinvigorating um you know if you do policy work i tell my students you better have an optimistic view on the world because it's slow progress and sometimes it's two steps forward three steps back one step back um but i i'm pretty optimistic about the, about the state of the world these days good well that's a good place to stop uh my guest has been roger pilkey jr making his record tying fifth appearance on the power hungry podcast roger it's always great to talk to you uh Robert, welcome, it's always fun thank welcome, you welcome welcome back to the u.s um that uh that sounds like a, a great trip. Um, okay, well, we'll stop there. Uh, thanks for tuning into this episode of the Power Hungry Podcast. If you want to uh, learn more about me or my work, uh, you can go to robertbrice.substack.com. And then, of course, you need to follow Roger, Roger Pookie Jr.substack.com. But until the next episode of the Power Hungry Podcast, see ya. <laughs>